Hello everyone, this is Jonathan Little. I'm here today with the 11th week of WeeklyPokerHand.com, where today I'm going to be going over one of my students' hands. This is from a cash game, which is, I believe, a first for WeeklyPokerHand.com. It's 2-5 no limit with extraordinarily deep stacks. We're sitting $1,800 deep. And whenever you're this deep stack, stuff gets pretty crazy. And if you want a full primer on how to play deep stacked poker, check out my book, Secrets of Professional Tournament Poker, Volume 1. In that book, I discuss how you should go about playing deep stack so that you're never in too many terrible situations. So here we raise it up a queens to 20 bucks. Uh, my student noted that the average raise at this game table is sort of like $50 if you want to get one caller and less if you want to get a lot of callers. And sure enough, he does get a lot of callers. The action checks around to us on the flop, and we bet 65, which I think is a pretty normal standard bet. I may make it a little bit larger here just to try to get full value. Whenever guys are calling a lot pre-flop, you're going to find that they do take cards off a pretty decent amount post-flop as well. So I'd probably bet something like 80 here. Everyone folds to the big blind who makes it 165. And my student commented here that his range, which is very good that my student is thinking about ranges, Includes drawing hands, mainly uh, small suited connectors that flop to pair and have a straight draw and a flush draw. Small to middle pairs, usually twos through eights. He would probably re-raise with nines or higher pre-flop to get heads up. And some hands like ace-jack suited, queen-jack suited, king-queen suited, etc. Uh, he also knows that he knows that my, as in my student's range, is uh, fairly wide in late position. He'll try to take the pot from him with lots of hands like that. So I think that's actually pretty good analysis of what this player's range is. I do think that he is going to show up with a lot of draws, maybe even like the ace X of diamonds, like, you know, ace four ace of diamonds, ace six of diamonds, ace five of diamonds. Uh, don't discount the fact that he actually could have six five here or ace five. Obviously, he could have all the sets. So if we come over here and take a look at our equity in the spot, we're going to find that Given that range, we are not in very good shape. Okay, here I've plugged in a range. The dark blue hands are only at diamonds. So we see a few flush draws. And then I have a bunch of uh, straight draws and pairs and whatnot. So assuming he's getting it all in with this entire range here. Let's write down the board. we will see that we actually only have 44% equity against this range. And now that's assuming he's going to get it all in with all of these hands. I actually think if you decide to, like, re-raise him here, he's going to get out of the way with these these weaker hands, like, um, say, 7-5 or um, maybe even 6-5. I don't think he's going to be getting all in too wide with those. Uh, two pair hands will probably go with 6-4. He may get out of the way. So let's let's give him this range now. And against this range, where he's getting it in with only good draws and um, made hands, you'll see that we're actually only have 42% equity. So even though we're sitting here with queens, this is a spot where I think you actually have a fairly easy call, because if you do re-raise, you're going to only get it in fairly bad. So, right here, you like to re-raise, and this is where I think you go wrong in the hand. I would uh, generally just tend to call here, because notice that Whenever you call here, you only need to be 23% to win, which, of course, you're going to be with queens in this spot, given the range we just gave them. But whenever you re-raise, now, if your opponent calls, you're really going to have no clue where you're at in the hand. And if he uh, re-raises, you're in a real world, of, real world of hurt, because now you're not going to really know what to do at all. So... Let's see what you wrote to me here. It's folded you, you re-raise him to 400, expecting him to fold most of his range. Well, like I just said, I'm not too sure he's going to be folding these flush draws. I think, like you said, if he's going to be very good and aggressive, he may just rip all these in. Let's assume he doesn't shove these flush draws here. Let's assume he decides to call for whatever reason. Let's assume he does go with this flush draw here. And, um... I actually have seven six in here. This needs to be only diamonds. 
76 offsuit he'll fold out. He'll certainly go with any straight. Um, these pairs he'll probably get out of the way with. Uh, or he'll maybe call or fold. So by the time you get it all in, you're going to be looking at something like this. A pretty, pretty strong range. And against this pretty strong range, you'll see they we're actually in very bad shape. 27% uh, equity. So assuming that's what he's going to be going with, that's not good. So all you're really doing here is you're forcing him off of his weaker hands. And as you see, um, this is 5% uh, of hands. If we add in all of his other hands that he could have had, let's make these diamonds here. Uh, you'll see that this is about 6% of hands. So let's actually assume he's even uh, raising here with like 9% of hands. He's still going to be going with 5% of those hands. So you think he's going to be folding here a lot, but in reality he's only going to fold like half the time. And when he does not fold, you're going to be in very, very, very bad shape. So you say he surprises you by shoving. Now, you say, knowing his tendency to slow play big hands and to make big bets with drawing hands to capture fold equity and put pressure on his opponents, I conclude he is much more likely to have a big draw or a pair and a draw than ace king, or than aces, kings, or flop set. So you think he'll slow play with sets, so you can sort of discount those. Let's go back over here and discount those sets. Let's actually um, take the sets out altogether. See how that changes things. It does increase your equity a decent amount, but again, you're still a decent dog here. Uh, clearly, he does not want to be called, you say. He is overbetting the pot by a lot. Well, that's not necessarily true, because right now, if he calls your 400, there'll be, there will be 900 in the pot, and he's shoving uh, 1,400 more in. So it's a little bit more than a pot size bet, but I still think it's not anything absurd. And uh, he wants to take it down right here. It takes me a while to get there, but ultimately I develop enough confidence and my read in him to call. And uh, let's see what happens. You do call, and he does have the 7 6 of diamonds. But notice that even against this hand, which is one of the best hands for us, watch what happens here. You're just a very slight favorite. So, really, all you're doing here is getting in an effective coin slip, flip situation, best case scenario. There are very few times where you're actually going to be in good shape here, in my opinion. I mean, I don't think he's going, I don't think he has to have a set or anything here, but he certainly could have like 4 3 and is just ripping it in because he doesn't want to get outdrawn. I mean, no one on, the, on this board is going to be slow playing too much, assuming they decide to check raise the flop. So, even though you do get it in good in this situation, I do not like the play, because again, you're only going to win 53% of the time, and you're risking like 350 big blinds. He does get there, and he scoops a nice pot. Uh, you say your reaction after the hand and now is that I should have flat called his check raise on the flop, which I think is absolutely correct, and waited to see a turn card before committing a lot of chips. If a safe looking turn card comes off and he checks, I can make a 3 fourth pot bet that denies him the pot outs to call. If a safe looking card comes off and he makes a sizable bet, you can reevaluate your read. As the hand was actually played, the 5 comes off, and I'm not about to invest a lot more chips after he puts pressure on me, just as, as if I wouldn't have a diamond come. My ill-advised re-raise cost me 1600 bucks. It actually didn't cost me $1,600, bucks in, I mean, I guess it did in real money, but not in equity. However, like you did say, right here when he check-raises you, let's just start the hand all the way over. When he check raises you here, my plan, as you said that what you should have done, is to just call. Then if a diamond comes off, or an ace, or a five, or a six, you should probably ditch the hand. If something like a two, three, or four comes off and he bets again, I would probably call, but I'd be pretty unhappy about it. And then if a, um, like an eight, nine, ten, jack, queen, king, or ace comes off, not an ace, sorry. All those besides an ace. I feel pretty confident about my hand. Like, even if a king comes, there's no reason for him to have a king here. If he bets the turn, then, like, shoves the river, I guess I would fold. So, I mean, I guess that's something that he could do that would be pretty powerful to exploit me, me personally, because I'm probably just going to find a fold if he bets 
a blank turn then shoves a blank river. But you'll find very few people that are just going to jam it all in for 350 big blinds with a, uh, a, a total busted draw. So, like you said, if you did call here in the terms of five and he bets, you can just muck. Because you're not really concerned with 7-6, but you are concerned with an ace, and you lose to any ace here. So, I, I totally agree with your analysis after the hand, and you have to get to where you can do this sort of analysis in the hand. And This is the situation that I, I really harp on in my book, Secrets of Professional Tournament Poker, Volume 1, is that right here, this is a spot where you just cannot re-raise, because you're going to be risking a ton of chips to win. Well, first off, look, look how little you're trying to win. And then, you know, you're risking a pretty good amount. Whenever he shoves, you just, you're just effectively flipping or are in bad shape. I mean, you're assuming your read on your opponent is 100% accurate. And, I mean, I'm honestly not too sure it is. I mean, he, I think most players that do have a set here would go ahead and pound the money in. So, I don't like the way you played it, but I do like how you thought about the hand, went back over the hand, and completely reevaluated the hand. So, congratulations on that. I know it's not no real consolation, but it's good that you're thinking about it and working on improving. So in part two, I'm going to take a look at this hand from my opponent's perspective and see how I think he played it from his point of view. This has been Jonathan Little for WeeklyPokerHand.com. Thanks for watching.